Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third Praxis Roundtable, hosted by the World Bank here in Sydney in partnership with The Diplomat magazine. My name's Ian Gerrard and I'm editor of The Diplomat. I'd particularly like to welcome everyone watching at home on APAC or over the internet or listening on radio across the Asia Pacific. Today's topic for discussion is climate change, an issue of immense importance around the world and particularly to developing nations in the Pacific. On the panel today are Marianne Groclaud, who is Sector Coordinator for Rural Development, Environment and Natural Resources Management for the World Bank's Pacific Department. Paul Gilding, who is a writer, advisor and advocate for action on climate change and sustainability. And Juanita Limpus, who is Secretary of the Kiribati Australia Association. 2009 has been called a crucial year in the international effort to address climate change. Al Gore said recently that he believes a political tipping point has been reached and that a global climate deal will be agreed in Copenhagen in December. However, the noises emanating from the EU, EU last week are less encouraging, especially for developing nations. The decision by EU leaders not to commit funds to the least developed countries and to not even make an offer until October, which is just two months before COP15, has been criticised by green groups and the UN alike. And let's not forget that it has now been three years since the World Bank produced its not if but when report, warning of the impact of climate change in the Pacific. According to the report, sea levels could rise by up to 90 centimetres by the end of the century. And in Kiribati, this, uh, this sea rise could cause flooding to 80% of the land mass in some areas. The World Bank report concluded that without adaptation policies and initiatives in place, the impacts of climate change are likely to be significant and pervasive and fall disproportionately on the poor. Sectors as varied as agriculture, water supply, coastal infrastructure, natural ecosystems and health are likely to be affected. Of course, in 2006, when that report was released, the international economy was in robust health. Even when the Ghana report was released here in Australia last year, global, cre global credit was yet to be crunched. Ghana spoke of the need to address climate change as one of those fateful decisions that will fundamentally alter the history of humanity. The question is, will the world's leaders be brave enough to take the decisions necessary to bring about effective climate change mitigation given the current economic situation? Kevin Rudd said over the weekend that it would be virtually impossible to prevent Australia sliding into recession, and Germany's foreign minister has already said the economic crisis changes priorities. So, will climate change be the biggest casualty of the global financial crisis? I'm going to leave that question hanging while we hear from our panellists, and once we've heard from each of them, I'm going to invite questions from the room. Uh, as I've said at previous Praxis Roundtables, don't be afraid to make those questions tricky ones or to challenge points that you don't agree with. The whole point of these roundtables is to promote debate and share new ideas. I'll introduce our first speaker now, Juanita Limpus. Juanita was born and grew up on Tarawa in what was then the British colony of the Gilbert Islands and is now the Republic of Kiribati. Uh, Juanita moved to Australia in 1976, eventually becoming an Australian citizen. In between raising a family, she has spent the last 18 years working for Queensland Education. She returned to Kiribati in 1991, 2004 and 2005 to see firsthand how her homeland is being affected by rising sea levels. And in 2005, together with her husband and friends, Winita helped found the Kiribati Australia Association. And she's going to be giving a very interesting and personal account of how climate change is affecting her homeland. Winita. Um, as we say in Kiribati, and in other words, it's blessings to everyone here. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the World Bank for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Um, just a little brief history about when I left Cuba, as Ian's already covered. I left in 1976 after I married an Australian, and since then I became a um, citizen of Australia. Um, I've been back again three times, 91, 2004 and 2005. In the meantime, I've given hospitality to um, numerous visitors from Kiribati over the 32 years that I've lived in Australia and obtained Agnadolt from Kiribati coming through, passing through Australia. As you probably already know, Kiribati consists of 33 atolls across the central Pacific, spanning from a distance um, the same as that's from Sydney to Perth. They've got more water than land. <laughs> The islands are very small and flat, with only three metres above sea level. 
at the most, and only a few hundred meters wide, and in some areas are even less. The population of Kiribati is 107,000, 43,000 of which reside on the capital island of Tarawa. That's where I was born. Kiribati is one of the most isolated countries in the world and one of the most vulnerable to climate change and rising sea levels. My visit in Kiribati in 19, 1991 was my rudest awakening to the climate change. On this occasion, a king tide leaped over a two meter retaining wall at my family's home and had a sum sitting in the kitchen table ankle deep in sea water. King tides used to be an annual event, but now it's occur every three weeks. Other problems that I um, um, encounter in Kiribati is they um, continue to be exposed to periodic surges of um, storms and droughts. The water table faces contamination with salt water due to the porous nature of the coral of which the island is made. The salt is very, very poor. This contamination of water table with salt water will eventually result in loss of vegetation, um, waterborne diseases, and render Kiribati unsustainable as a place where people can live. This will happen well before the ocean actually engulfs it. So we're all talking about, you know, going in the sea, but there are more problems before that happens. So the question I'd like to bring it up here is, what will happen to the Kiribati people then? Can they be an independent nation when their land is no longer exists? Would they still have their own government and a vote in the United Nations? How will they manage cultural wipeout that must surely follow? Where will the Kiribati people go? Will families be scattered around the world? This is very drastic for people of a culture steeped in extended family. Does global warming mean they will be warmly received by others? People displaced by climate change are not legally regarded as refugees. There is not a law that caters to it. Yet a refugee from a tyrant or political or, or um, religious oppression can still live in the hope, though it may be decades or generation, that they may be one day returned to their homeland and tread their feet once more on their ancestral land. But what hope is there of that for those people wh whose homeland has sunk beneath the waves? Are they not refugee of a special category in the general English usage of the word refugee? But where are their rights in our existing laws? How will we deal with it? The Kiribati Australia Association acts as a facilitator of the goodwill between the wider Australian community and the Kiribati Australians, as well as Kiribati visiting, including students. Once a year in July, we had a cultural festival to celebrate Kiribati independence, involving folk songs and dances. And this is as much as for our wider Australian community as for Kiribati Australian and Kiribati visitors. Education um, of Kiribati children is more, more important than ever before and must prepare them to be able to live and work anywhere in the world. The Kiribati Australia Association makes a modest attempt to help in its own small way by collecting used school reading books, um, second-hand computers, um, and we send them to non-government in Kiribati. In partnership with um, the Kiribati Australia Association is the Baha'i Faith, and recently we've um, got the Lions International on board in Brisbane. And just to illustrate the need in Kiribati, um, one Catholic school of an outer island just sent us a request for second-hand computers because it had 500 pupils and only 20 computers to go around. And um, we just recently we sent 30 
secondhand computers, otherwise they would have been at the tip. So we're trying to use secondhand materials to help Kiribati, you know, for the er education, because I think that's so important. Um, we assist Kiribati schools, not just for a service for Kiribati people, but also as a service to those communities who allow them to join them, so that they might be an asset and not a burden. Kiribati people have a very deep spirituality, loyalty to family and respect for the elders, and indeed are very caring and sharing people. And before I finish, I would like to take the um, opportunity for the, um, the previous government, um, Howard government, and the present Gavin Rudd um, government for providing Kiribati with the um, scholarship for Kiribati um, Australia Nursing Initiative, which is creating qualified nurses um, that they will be needed everywhere in the world. So I think that's very important. If these people are going to be migrated to other part of the world, that we don't see them as a burden. They can contribute to the economy of whatever country they're being sent to. And um, we welcome more assistance that we can get to endeavour. And again, I thank the World Bank for um, having me here today. And as we say in Kiribati, the Maori, the Rai, and the Dabumua, which means in English, peace, health, and prosperity. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Juanita. Uh, interesting questions raised. What will happen to the people of Kiribati? And it's great to get a personal account uh, from someone who, who feels it most deeply. Um, our next speaker is Paul Gilding. Paul is an independent writer, advisor, and advocate for action on climate change and sustainability. He has been an activist and social entrepreneur for 35 years and is widely recognized as a global authority on sustainability and business. He has worked with the CEOs and executives of many leading companies, including ANZ and IAG here in Australia, and DuPont and Ford overseas. Paul is a former executive director of Greenpeace International and founder of Ecos Corporation and Easy Being Green. He is currently a member of the core faculty at Cambridge University's Program for Sustainability Leadership and a special advisor on climate change to KPMG. Paul. Thanks, Ian. I want to talk about the kind of broader, longer term picture around climate change and sustainability and what it means for the economy. I think, you know, especially given our current context, um, the economic implications of this issue for, for us all going forward, I think, are quite profound. But let me just first start with a few comments about the science of climate change. Um, first thing is to understand that the climate, climate science is now broadly accepted. There is no significant scepticism left in the scientific community. There are individuals who, you know, make the argument that it, there, there is doubt in the area. It's just not true. Um, and if you look at that from a kind of rational perspective, as we try to look at that you know, societally in these areas, what you see is a significant consensus around there being a serious risk. And that to me is where we are today and we shouldn't spend too much time worrying about those who disagree with that because that's a, that's a healthy thing in science to have scepticism. It's not a healthy thing in terms of society once you get to that point. So I think that's the first like, kind of a, a point of departure. The second thing I wanted to say about the science though is that the, the more recent science, and again this is not forecast, this is not hypothesis, this is actual measurement, so everything is much worse than we expected it to be at this stage. Right? So whatever parameter you're looking at, whether it be emissions levels and where they are, whether it be concentrations, whether it be the ability of the oceans to absorb CO2, whether it be the melting of the north, northern ice cap, um, everything we look at, temperature and so on, is all at the upper end of the uncertainty range we forecast 20 years ago. So that again just reinforces that we know what's going on. Um, and unfortunately, we, we, don't, we don't know how bad it was going to be, but it's, it's where we thought it would be at the worst end of that spectrum. So, the reason that's important in this context is that we are going to face very severe consequences, right? There is absolutely no data, I would argue, in the political realm or the public opinion world or the science realm which says we are going to respond substantially in any meaningful time frame to all of the courts we're currently on in the next few decades because of the lag times involved in response. Therefore, we're going to face consequences at the upper end of all the forecasts in this area. So I think that's a really important point because it's no longer the case that we can act as a preventative issue on climate change. We are now adapting as well as mitigating at the same time. So there's no option there but to do both for, for the reasons that uh, Juanita was talking about. All that to me is though in many ways not the major, major issue. They're, they're all symptoms of the problem. And the problem is that the economic system, the growth consumer economy that we've all become very enamoured with globally, 
um, is fundamentally flawed in the sense that it is a, a system operating as though there are no limits in a system in which there are limits. Right? So there literally are limits to how big this economy can get in its current um, structure and design, and we are now reaching those limits. So I would argue, and I argued a year or so ago before the financial crisis hits, which seems like a long time ago now. I remember that when the oil prices were high and food prices were high all that time ago, less than nine months or so. Um, that was, to me, in many ways, the system reaching its limits. So when you have a physical system, which is what this is, of consumption of materials, growing consumption, growing waste, growing emissions and so on, and that system reaches its limits, then it bumps up against limits, like any system does, and stops growing. Right, so what we had last year was booming oil prices, booming food prices, you know, all the signs that the system was coming up against its capacity to support itself, and then it, it, it drew back as a dish of bacteria does in a petri dish, as a rainforest does, as any system does once it reaches those limits, it starts to withdraw back again. And that's where I think we are now. So we're now bumping up against those limits. And I think that we are at that point, and we'll start this point for some time to come, where the economy physically can't grow anymore. You know, it will bounce back from where it is now, I think, up and down a bit, but it fundamentally is up against its limits, which I think is a really important context. So there is actually very good news in all of that. And that is simple, that there is no evidence in history, in my view, that we respond to any significant issue which requires change until the crisis hits. And we are now at the point of crisis. So we are now in the situation, what we call the so-called global financial crisis, which I say so-called because if you think that's a crisis, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, you know, we are going to have a crisis of economic growth and we're going to be stuck there for quite some time until we change. So the good news is we're going to change. Uh, not because of any philosophical viewpoint or any you know, arrival of Obama or anything else, but because of physics and biology. You simply cannot grow an economy in that way um, without there being consequences and we're now up against the consequences. So the, the particularly good news about that is that this crisis is absolutely fundamental. It's what I call the great disruption. You know, so we are facing the great disruption to our current civilization, which is that we can't continue on as we are and therefore we'll be forced to change. The good news in that change is that we know what we need to do. Right? And it's not just about renewable energy. It is to actually question the fundamentals of our Western consumer model, which I said is now spreading across the world. And that fundamental is that, um, is that we, we cannot physically grow that economy any further. And we don't need to and we don't want to, because in the West, once you get to a certain level of wealth, there is no improvement in quality of life beyond that point. And that, in many ways, is the, the fundamental core of our problem, is that the economic system we've designed assumes that life is better when you get richer. And it absolutely is from zero to about thirty to $50,000 a year. There's no question it is dramatically better, and that's why people pursue that model. But all the data says, once you get beyond, you know, different surveys, different models, but thirty, fifty, dollars 100000 a year thereabouts per capita income dollars, um, then you don't get any happier. And society doesn't get improve its quality of life. And that doesn't change at all until you get disgustingly rich, in which case it starts to go down again. Right, so it's sort of this very clear curve of I feel better, I feel better, I feel better, I don't feel any better, I'm getting richer, I'm getting richer, I'm getting really, really rich and now I feel worse. Right, so that, that kind of idea is now well established in the science of, of well-being and I think it's a really important context for us. So we are going to have to question the fundamentals of how we grow the economy and we're going to have to do that because we're forced to by the crisis of climate change. So climate change is the sort of front and centre issue, but it's not the only issue. It is, I think, the most important issue, but it's not the only issue by any means. It is simply a symptom of the problem. The problem is that we have an ecosystem which is actually suffering badly at, at our hand. You know, it is actually starting to break apart. We're no longer getting the ecosystem services that we need to survive as a society. But also we're suffering from the other limit, which is complexity. Right, that we have built a global economy and society which is so complex and so interrelated that nobody can manage it anymore, which means that it has enormous risks attached to it. And it's those risks that we've seen in recent months that have seen the system start to, start to come tumbling down. So I think for all those reasons where we're about to see massive change, we are going to see enormous suffering. You know, Kiribati is simply one example of an extreme level of dislocation and suffering that will be caused to many people around the world, I think, with great consequences. Um, but we are going to see, as a result of that crisis, the change. As I say, the good news is we know what to do. Right? If you look at, and I, I think it's the only really useful comparison, in World War II, when um, Pearl Harbor was bombed, the US economy converted 70% of its industrial capacity to the war effort in nine months. Right? Military spending in the US as a percentage of GDP went from 1% in 38, 39 to 35% in 45. 
Right, so when we put our minds to it, we do absolutely extraordinary things and we achieve unbelievable levels of change incredibly quickly. But we don't do it until the invading armies are coming over the parapets. And in that case, the bad news for us and the good news for us is that that's where the invading armies now are, just that they're inside us, not external. And we're about to change and I think see a very significant um, shift in that area. So thank you. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, so just consider the onus to be on the government or on people pressuring the government, on business or a combination of all of them? Of course it's everything is always a standard answer for good reason because it is about everyone, but it is about people more than anything else. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't see any evidence um, from you know, 15 years of working inside the corporate sector or 20 years before that working as an activist. I don't see any evidence that companies or governments will change until people change. Yeah. But right? you and therefore we have to change the people first. Exactly. So before we get the response. Education of yeah. the people. All those things. Yeah. Education but more I think education's got to be about what we can do to change what we expect and what we want, as opposed to what they should do. So it's not the traditional campaigning saying we've got a problem, we must now all demand that they go and fix it. Right? I think we've got to recognise that we have to start with fixing it ourselves and they will then respond to that reality. Great. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, and finally, I'd like to introduce Marianne uh, Groclaude. Marianne is the Sector Coordinator for Rural Development, Environment and Natural Resources Management for the World Bank Specific Department. With a uh, background as an agriculture and natural resources economist, she has been with the World Bank for nine years, working on rural development, environment and natural resources management issues. For the last three years, Marianne has been coordinating the bank's work program in the Pacific on those issues, in particular developing activities on climate change, adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Marianne. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to listen to us today. The, um, the international debate on climate change has been very much uh, focused on uh, mitigation, on mitigating climate change. Um, and um, as Paul illustrated, it's not only about counting carbon, it's really uh, about looking at growth and growth patterns and what changes are needed. Uh, and that's a major challenge. There is also another major challenge that is gradually taking the centre stage uh, in the debate, and that's the question of adapting to climate change. Uh, and the case of Kiribati very much illustrates uh, the scale uh, of the challenge and the difficulties there. Uh, one of the major features in the climate change, uh, with climate change, is the fact that there is an asymmetry uh, between the causes and the consequences and impact of climate change. Historically, developed countries um, have uh, been the source of the, uh, the bulk of uh, greenhouse gases emissions, both on an absolute basis and on per capita basis. But it is developing countries that are going to be hit hardest and the earliest. And in particular, the poor are the ones that are uh, going to be hit hardest because they live in more marginal areas, uh, depend on fragile resources. They often depend more on natural resources. Uh, and they also have fewer resources to cope. Um, maybe a few figures to, to illustrate that. Um, it is estimated that in the 1990s, about 2 billion people in developing countries have been affected by a climate-related disaster. In developed countries, this was only a small percent of a population. And since 2000, it has increased a little bit, but it's still a few percent. <coughs> in developing countries, in the 1990s, the proportion of a population that was affected by such disasters was 40%. Since 2000, this has raised to 80%. Kiribati is another example of the magnitude of the impact we're talking about. When we started to working with the Kiribati government in the late 90s on their adaptation initiatives, we tried to quantify uh, what the impact on the economy would be, um, looking at the most pessimistic climate change scenarios and looking at a do-nothing uh, scenario. And our estimates then was uh, of a reduction of GDP of around 34%. Now, as Paul mentioned, science is that now telling us that these more, more pessimistic scenarios are becoming reality. Um, they are not becoming reality now. They've actually been reality in Kiribati for a few decades, as Juanita um, uh, discussed. And um, Kiribati and other uh, neighbours of Australia have been very vocal and very active in international negotiations in bringing uh, the attention of developed countries 
uh, to the situation of developing countries and to the need to put more resources and more effort into adaptation initiatives. Um, so how are we going on adaptation? Well, some countries are talking about comprehensive adaptation plans, both developed countries, developing countries, uh, and indeed uh, developed countries are pledging more resources to work on adaptation. Um, although, as you mentioned, there are still some concerns about how many, re how much resources. Um, and we could even say that everyone is talking about mainstreaming adaptation now. Uh, however, what we are learning uh, as we work uh, with developing countries on adaptation measures is that it's a very sobering business and there are many pitfalls. Uh, we're working with countries where institutions and systems are weak. They're struggling to de deliver basic services and infrastructure. Uh, so mainstreaming climate change into systems that are not working well is obviously not enough and there is a need to look at it in a broader, from a broader development perspective and how do you strengthen systems? How do you improve the way services are delivered? Uh, there are endless discussions in terms of the science and do we have enough data? Do we need better data to um, move forward? But I think Paul has already answered that question. Um, there are questions also about institutions. Climate change used to be something that environment departments, environment ministries were dealing with. Um, it's now becoming more of a development issue and all sectors have to uh, get involved. Uh, this means uh, sectors collaborating, working together. This is not something we're very good at. Um, if we look at overseas development assistance, um, there is also a tendency to look at it in terms of projects, adaptation projects, rather than looking at it as a core development issue. Um, and that's another pitfall uh, of the earlier uh, adaptation programs. Uh, there have actually been studies as well done of um, overseas development assistance and how uh, programs integrate climate, climate risks. Uh, and, and the numbers that came out of the studies are that um, uh, about 40, 50 percent of uh, the sample of programs that were looked at were uh, facing uh, significant climate risks, but only 2 percent on average of those programs had integrated those risks into their design. So there's still a way to go and many things that can be done. Um, but uh, this is not to say that these are not opportunities. Um, adaptation uh, programs and looking at responding to climate change uh, provides opportunity to look at doing things uh, differently and do things that make sense uh, in any case. Um, in the case of Kiribati, our government is looking not only at increasing, securing the water supply, uh, which is a major issue with sea level rise, uh, but also more efficient water use. Um, they are looking uh, at protecting uh, the public infrastructure from coastal erosion, uh, which also provides it opportunities for better land management, uh, better spatial planning, uh, better risk management as well. Um, so there are opportunities, uh, and, and I guess that relates also to the points that uh, you were making on um, growth patterns and how we develop and, and the changes that are needed there. Uh, maybe I'll finish with the, the most difficult question, which is that of whether um, adaptation is enough and whether it's a viable option for countries like Kiribati. Um, I think what um, Juanita is telling us is maybe it's already not enough uh, and already too little too late we're doing in the case of countries like Kiribati and uh, government uh, and its partners are also looking at migration and relocating people, and that's gonna be unavoidable. Um, for those of us working uh, with uh, countries like Kiribati, that means uh, we have to seriously think about what can be done uh, to prepare uh, for, um, for, this, uh, for migration. Um, and uh, that's also uh, looking, as you said, at uh, education, 
and how to prepare not only those that are going to migrate, but also those that might receive uh, some of those people. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open up uh, the floor to questions now. Um, as I said at the start, if you've got a question, if you raise your hand, then Alita will come around with a microphone, and then if you stand up, identify yourself and your organization, and then ask your question for us, please. So can I have a show of hands? Down at the front, please. Uh, g'day. Uh, thanks to you all. My name is James Cox. I work for World Vision Australia, um, and my question is actually for Marianne. Uh, you talked about the, um, the, the implications for ODA in particular and it made me think about the 0.7% of GDP commitment that countries have made and the short question, will that be enough, do we need to be thinking about a whole different level of commitment over and above that in relation to ODA? Um, I think indeed um, we came to the conclusion that there will be a need for more resources. Um, there is a cost. Uh, in climate change adaptation. Uh, it's going to make development more expensive. Uh, in looking at our own resources, uh, we calculated that cost uh, at somewhere between 6 and 21% more for the three coming years. Uh, so it calls for more resources, um, but it also calls for better use of existing resources. Um, I think the um, focus should also be on what is it we can do better in existing programs. Uh, for example, a lot of programs that look at water supply tend to focus a lot on more supply, more resources, rather than savings and better use and better efficiency. That could apply as well to energy programs. Um, how do we use energy better? It's not just about more renewable energy, but also where are the savings? Um, so, yeah, in short, it's not just about more resources. It's also about how we use resources that are already there. That's great. Energy is actually going to be the, the topic of the next Praxis Roundtable next month, so there's uh, issues there that we can perhaps explore a little further uh, next month. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in now. I've got one for, for you, uh, Winita. <clears throat> in in Kir Kiribati, um, are the people accepting of climate change? Do they, they understand what's happening there? Do, do they uh, realise how, exactly how it's going to impact on their lives? I think for the young people, they're very much aware of what's happening. But sadly for the, um, the older generations, like my grandmothers, my mother's age group, um, they don't believe in it because as far as they can see, God won't let it happen. <laughs> so um, it's sad, and, you know, but the young people are very much aware of it, and, you know, so. I think the young people too are, are ready, you know, they're trying to educate themselves so they know that when the time comes when they have to migrate, they're, you know, well prepared. But I think what they're worried about is the young, the, the older people, they don't want to leave their homeland. And so it's easier for them to think that God won't let it happen. Great. Uh, yes, please, in the middle here, Alita. My name is Frank Hutchinson. I'm from the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies at Sydney University. Uh, wh one of the things that strikes me uh, about the debates that have gone on around climate change is a kind of sense that often we have that the future is overwhelming, that we have a sense of powerlessness about trying to address, address some of the fundamental <laughs> issues. And each of the panellists has actually raised some quite critical issues about how we might actually move forward. And, and of the panellists, I suspect that Paul has actually put his finger on some of the, the underlying fundamental dilemmas that we face. And he mentions that in many ways we've moved beyond uh, a stage in which we can look at prevention, but we need to look at adaptation and mitigation. But if, if, uh, if it's just as simple as that, uh, are we actually looking at some sort of transformation? And what I sort of get from my sense from what, what Paul is talking about is a shift in attitude, quite a fundamental shift in attitude in terms of our civilizational approach to the ways in which we live with each other, our relationships to other societies and cultures, and our relationships to the environment. The question I pose is in relation to education. How do we combine a sense of realism about where the world might be, be headed with a sense of practical hope? Yeah, thanks, Frank. I think that's a, uh, to me, this is probably the most important question in this in this whole area right now. 
um, because I think we are, many people who are like myself, who spend decades working on the issue, have the conversation frequently about despair. You know, what do you do when you spend 30 years preventing a problem from happening and then it starts happening all around you, and yet no one still seems to be responding to it. So there is a sense where the kind of hopelessness of that is, is actually quite a powerful thing. And I think, again, I'd, I'd refer to the kind of war analogies that I think, you know, obviously that's problematic for a whole range of reasons, but it gives, gives us lots of lessons. And those situations, I think, in World War II in particular, we did see that debate. You know, should we give in? You know, is appeasement better? You know, shall we now compromise? You know, what, what's worth saving? How much do you fight? And so on. And there is, even though it's a very different kind of conflict, because it's the enemy was, is within in that sense, there is, there is, I think, a very powerful lot of lessons there. And I think there is a lot of faith to be had in human ingenuity and in people's preparedness to change. But I think Frank's point is right, which is that we need to have... You know, many people talk about an evolution of consciousness, that we actually need... Now, you can see that in a spiritual sense, or we can see it just in a practical value sense, that we need to think differently about how we see the environment, how we see you know, value in, in economic terms and how we translate that into our lives in a practical sense. How do we think about going shopping? You know, I mean, it comes down to shopping in the end, right? I mean, the consumer society is not a theoretical construct. It's all of us going out shopping, right? So how do we shop? Why do we shop? How do we shop less? What are the consequences of that? And how do we retrain ourselves around that? And that, to me, is your point about education. I think there's actually a very powerful thing. You know, one of the, one of the campaigns I think about running now is how do you shop less? You know, literally practical steps for individuals on how do you put off a major purchase for a week while you think about it? How do you not buy things when you go and do them you know, impulsively? How do we educate our children? You know, I had one of these classics the other day with, with my eight-year-old who desperately wanted to buy this particular thing and shucked a complete you know, tantrum about it and was crying. It was a disaster. It was the worst thing in the world that ever happened to him in the history of his life. Right? And within 20 minutes, he said, actually, I didn't want that. <laughs> right? So there's that, that education of all of us around these issues, I think. It, it's not a theoretical kind of philosophical framework anymore. It's actually much more practical. And that, I think, is where we need to go to on a whole range of levels, how we relate to each other, how we build more resilient communities, how we relate to the environment. And these are educational questions, but not just school educational questions, but more kind of community-wide and parenting and, and peer educational questions. And do you believe that the, the fundamental community desire for that is there? I mean, because especially at the minute, mm -hmm. people are looking over their shoulders, they're seeing the Unemployment Express, yep. you know, approaching fast, and they're going, to be, they're going to be more concerned about their jobs than they are about climate change, and surely that's going to have a massive impact on political okay. strategies. I mean, it could be my blind optimism, but, uh, but I think I'm actually very bullish about people's response being more positive in this crisis than worse. Right? I think they are going to actually see that there is something quite deep going on here. I wrote a piece on what I call the Great Disruption a year ago, talking about what I saw as the coming crisis in, in capitalism and, and society around these issues. And you know, I got a lot of interest at the time amongst my kind of network. And then Tom Friedman wrote a story about this in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. And I was just flooded with responses. And it, was, it wasn't about the idea being you. Obviously, Tom Friedman has a wide reach. But I, I spoke to Tom about it, who I know. And he said, look, I haven't had a response to an article like this for a very long time. And it was because it was going to the core of something that we have a fundamental belief about, but people are ready to change. And I've had emails and bloggers contacting me from all over the world who are deeply enmeshed in this particular issue saying, we are now ready for a change because of the economic, economic crisis, so-called, not as a, as a response to it, but not, not less so because of it, but more so because of it. And it's like, and I think what people are seeing is their political leaders are saying, we're having a crisis in the economy bought by buying stuff that we can't afford with money that we can't afford to pay back. So here's some more money to go and do some more of it. Right? And people are saying, well, that doesn't actually make sense. Right? And that, 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 so I think there is a deep sense of opportunity for a bigger change. But it's a very difficult change because it does go to the very core. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, another question? Yes, over here, please. Hi, my name's Evelyn. Just following on what you just said, with people being ready for change, what can governments do to incentivize that sort of initial, you know, motivation to want to do that because at the end, you know, if if you got if I'm if people tend to choose when they go shopping, if sustainable wood versus normal wood, if the sustainable one is more expensive, you go, yeah, sounds good, I like the idea, you know, you get emotional, but they're gonna end up going for something cheaper. So that's that incentive. What what can government do to accelerate that process? You you've said, yeah, any ideas would be, you know, you can throw around the table. Thanks. Uh, Paul, I suspect <laughs> that could be you. Okay. Um, look, I think you know, we have a whole global economy 
and massive market trying to make things convenient and easy for us to act. Right? It's all around get it here, get it now, pay for it later. It, it, there's a whole system around convenience. So I think what government can do is make it easier. But I think people do have a desire to, to do the right thing and to pay more in some cases, but sometimes not to. But either way, making it easier to do that. So, so just a little example. You know, they have these enormous subsidies on solar hot water now in your home. Right? So you can get several thousand dollars back. But you've got to pay it to the installer and then apply to the government to get it back and it comes back to you three months later. So if you can't afford to do that, you don't do that. So that's again a very sort of stupid example where government is making it difficult for us to act. But the policy appears to be in place to make it easy. So the politics are good, but the consumerism is not. Right? So I think we've got to learn how to make things a lot easier and a lot more convenient and, and facilitate the the transition in that sense. Because I think people want it. The, the market demand, if you like, is for action. It's how do you make that more, more effective. Yeah. A question at the front, please. Uh, Thomas Ernst from the World Bank. Uh, interesting how you're saying you're hoping that the consumers will shop less. And it's interesting timing with the fiscal stimulus package there and encouraging consumers doing the exact opposites. Mm. So uh, I guess um, you know people talk about climate change, and I completely agree with you. I think that it does need to be a fundamental attitude shift because talk about climate change in a country like Canada and people say, hey, that's great, I won't have minus 40 winters anymore, wonderful warm tropics, but you come to Australia and I actually think a lot of Australians are aware of things that are happening in Kiribati and you know, flooding in Bangladesh in the future and so I think it's still this sort of not in my backyard, you know, I don't want the desalinization plant in my backyard, I don't want the nuclear power plant. So I guess my question is, do you think that uh, the right to a safe environment and a clean environment should, should be a human right actually? Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, we need to. We need to. Yeah, I often hear about not in my backyard, and I suppose it's really hard because a lot of people are afraid. You know, when they think about Kiribati, they think they're going to be all migrated to Australia, taking up their jobs and and all that, and that's a big concern. You know, and um, I don't know what the answer for that. But I'm trying to educate. You know, people that. Not many people want to leave Kiribati, you know, only some, maybe half the population. I'm not quite sure, I don't know what the, the number is, but I often tell people that don't worry about people from Kiribati, they're going to be all leaving Kiribati and coming migrated to Australia. The, peop the old people love to stay there. It's hard for them to migrate somewhere else because of the language. Um, although, like in Kiribati, I mean, English is one of their um, official language, so it's, it's easier for the young people to migrate to other places, but, but the older people, the young people are afraid um, leaving their um, elders because that's so important for them, that family unit. So I don't know what the answer is to that. Mm. Uh, do we have any more questions from the floor? floor please? Yes. Jack Whelan from Environment Business Australia. Um, we hear a lot of uh, discussion in the debate around climate change and the causes of climate change, which which goes roughly this, that uh, you know, there is enough uh, global warming potential already in the system that is going to cause a great deal of, uh, of, of damage, you know, sea level rise and, and greater frequency and severity of, of disaster events. And so bearing that in mind, I'm just wondering wh what the panel might think of the fact that if so much attention is now going to be turned into adaptation and other, other sort of instant remedies really for countries that are going to be most severely affected, what's the danger of that then taking away resources from other development objectives, particularly through the Millennium Development Goals and in particular countries in the Pacific is a very good example where there are people who are living in really uh, conditions whereby they could really benefit from uh, better energy uh, supplies, better water supplies, better health and other resources. So I'm just wondering whether in fact we should perhaps be starting to say, well actually we're going to have to prepare for the worst, but meanwhile we've got to at least make the conditions under which those people are living uh, a little bit more bearable. Thank you. Paul, could you? Sure. I think the, um, uh, there is no solution to the fundamental problem except for a much greater equality of development. Right? There is no solution to climate change or sustainability, which is just about technology or just about addressing the actual causes. You have to address the underlying issues, and one of the underlying issues is inequity. Right? And, and it's just an obscenity that you know, some people have private jets and some people can't eat. I mean, it's just, I don't want to live in that world. 
right? So you cannot fix this without fixing that as well. Um, but it gets back to this issue about how, what values do we need to build a new society around, right? And one of those values is not equality, literally, but a greater sense of equality. So a greater fairness around our society at all levels, right? And I think there is a deeper kind of consciousness shift that we have to make there around those issues, which the average person doesn't yet understand. They, don't, they worry about the bunch of people from Kiribati moving in next door. Right? But that's a fear-driven response. And so we kind of have to move beyond that, recognise that will be there, but move beyond that to the sort of next level of human development in that sense, and I think address those issues. So, you know, population, technology, all these issues come from having a reasonable standard of living, right? It comes from having a basis of, of security about education, about your kids' future. So that, yeah, that has to be the framework from which we start. So I don't think it can be either rule. I think it's got to be, yes, developing all those things, but developing in terms of economies in a different way than we have in the past. And, and likewise, just another issue which I thought you were going to, but, but I think is an important question, is adaptation versus mitigation. You know, many people have argued for a long time that we can't afford to let people focus on adapting because there are too many people like Lomberg and so on who argue that it's cheaper to adapt than it is to prevent, right? Which is actually, it's technically wrong, right? But it's also just idiotic. So for both those reasons, idiotic and wrong, we shouldn't do it. But it's, it's like there is a, uh, you cannot adapt to a runaway climate change world. I mean, you cannot, it's just not enough. You can't make the walls big enough, right? It just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. So you have to actually recognise that both these things happen at once. And the adaptation story, how do we have to build, you know, a dike across Sydney Harbour, right, is actually part of getting people to get ready to adapt, to then mitigate, right? So we have to actually get people to recognise that it is too late to stop some of the worst impacts, uh, and therefore the prevention issue becomes more, not less important in response. Um, moving on to the wider Pacific now, Marianne, I just wonder if you can give us some examples of uh, how climate change is impacting on other areas in the Pacific, uh, aside from um, Kiribati. Well, uh, there are many areas where, um, that are affected from, by sea level rise apart from Kiribati uh, in other countries in the Pacific. Um, on higher grounds, uh, what our people are experiencing is uh, more climate variability, and which is affecting, for example, in the agricultural sector, the yields and predictability of their yields. Uh, in Papua New, Gu New Guinea, for example, if you go and talk with coffee producers, they will tell you, well, the weather is not what it used to be. We used to have a long season uh, that would allow the plants to flower, and this hasn't happened this year, and this hasn't happened last year, so we get lower yields. So that's uh, one thing that uh, is happening. Um, there is an, a health impact uh, we hear about. Uh, mosquitoes going up the slopes, basically, uh, and malaria in areas that are higher altitude where it wasn't a few years ago. Um, that's another scary thing. Um, the uh, other major change is the incidence of uh, extreme climate events, drought, uh, cyclones, uh, storms. Uh, the incidence is increasing in the Pacific. Um, and, and the impact, of course, on small countries that have um, small resource base is much higher than in larger countries. Uh, any more questions from the floor, please? Uh, my name is Grace Peng. I'm from the Institute of International Affairs, but I'm really a banker. So anyway, I just want to ask Juanita, what is the preference of the people of Kiribati? Do you want to remain as a nation? And would, would that mean like building a dike around the island? Or you know, is it like moving to another place, but keeping the people together? I mean, knowing that Holland has got um, three quarters of the land under sea level for the last, I don't know how many years. So is that a viable alternative? Thank you. Well, I was talking to one of the um, Kiribati peasants visiting Australia just um, a few days ago, and she expressed concern that they want to remain as a nation. Um, they wanted to keep that Kiribati culture, they want to preserve it, they want to... So, if you talk to the young people here, yeah, they're quite happy to migrate, um, but as long as they can have their families with them. So, it's mixed feelings. I think mainly they wanted to reserve the island. What about getting preserve together it. with other people with very serious problems like this, like the Maldives and all that? Is there anywhere to go? Is it the United Nations? Is it the World Bank? Is it uh, some other international body? Thank you. 
I think the major concern is that what happened when they migrate, they worry about their culture. Um, uh, is it possible for them to have a sovereign somewhere else? You know, I mean, if they can't save the islands, I mean, that's their pre um, first preference. But if it can't be saved, are there um, there are alternatives? Okay, we've got time for one more question from the floor. Yes, Kirk Huffman. I'm a research associate at the Australian Museum and with the Maclay Museum at Sydney University. But I've spent more than half of the last 35 years in the Western Pacific, working with traditionally orientated cultures with less missionary influence than you have in, in Kiribati. Uh, there's great difference in attitudes, indigenous attitudes to climate change. Those who've been influenced greatly by Christianity, and remember that the Pacific is the most Christian area in the world. There's more active church churchgoers in the Pacific than there are, for example, in the United States, percentage-wise. Uh, but Christian uh, influence communities, uh, like Juanita was saying, very often the older ones say, oh, well, it can't happen because God said in the Bible that it wouldn't happen. In the Western Pacific, in the communities that I've been working with since the early 1970s, there are many communities that have, for example, refused Christianity, haven't yet had missionaries in them, uh, or actually fought off uh, influences from the modern world to retain their, old cult their own cultural identity. Uh, and, and they're aware of climate change. They think it's the white man's fault. And they say, if it's the white man's fault, they should pay. That's the traditional thing in Melanesia. If somebody does something wrong, then they have to pay a fine. It's like if you kill somebody by accident, uh, then the per the, you have to pay back to the family of the person you've killed the blood fine. Basically, many, uh, many of these communities in the Western Pacific, the, the, their attitude is, yes, it's the fault of the modern world or the white man or modern development. That's the thing they're worried about. And therefore, if it's their fault, then therefore the modern world has to pay for if we have to move, for example. Now, for, but also there's this idea of if you have to move, where do you move to? Now, uh, two years ago there were representatives from the Carteret Islands off of Bougainville in Papua New Guinea that came to Australia to plead for awareness and assistance about their case. They're being shifted off of their islands now. Here in Australia, many people thought, oh, they're asking for help to come to move to Australia. But the Carteret Island representatives were very puzzled. They said, we don't want to come to Australia. We don't know anybody here. People eat different types of food. And it's a very strange, very stressful lifestyle. We want assistance to move to the neighboring high island of Bougainville so that we can live with real people, uh, with people who are, speak languages and have cultures linked to ours. And that you'll find, I think, in many areas of the Pacific. The younger generation, of course, in Kiribati, they'd all love to come here, I suppose. Eh? Um, but uh, in most of Melanesia, the western part of the Pacific, and don't forget that a quarter of all the languages and cultures on the face of the earth are literally on Australia's doorstep there. New Guinea, Solomons, Vanuatu, New Caledonia. Most of them would probably prefer in the low-lying islands to move to neighboring high, high islands, eh? because there they can, be with the, they can be with their own people. They won't have funds to uh, move themselves. Uh, therefore, their attitude is, is the modern world should assist them. And basically, uh, scientists and stuff would say, oh, they can't be right. But the thing is, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Eh? Uh, and also, many of these societies uh, contain, the, the ones that have remained traditional, have retained vast memory banks of, of weather events in the past. They really know about this sort of stuff. Uh, just things like, for example, the tsunami in um, Indonesia a few years ago. Now, there was a very interesting case in the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. There are two groups of Negrito pygmies there, the Onge and the Ang, otherwise known as the Jarawa, who've been there for 40,000 years. There were 6,000 Bengalis killed in the tsunami. Not a single one of the Onge or the Ang were killed because they remember, through oral history, the last tsunami of the same type between six to eight hundred years ago. They know exactly the signs, and they were all up and away before the thing happened. Um, these sorts of cultures, they know how to deal with climate change. Um, and the modern world is, is, is making things happen to them. They're not responsible for any of this. The societies I work with, they've retained their cultures. They don't like clothes, many of them. They refuse education. But they're the winners, the ones that are living on the high islands. Eh? They're the, none of them are in debt. 
That's great. Sorry. That's a very interesting point to finish on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much Respect for that. Respect for indigenous views is important. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, coming today. I'd just like to uh, thank our panellists, uh, Winita Limpus, Paul Gilding and Marianne Groclaude. As I said, the next Praxis Roundtable is going to be on the subject of uh, energy. You can uh, see this one on APAC or on the World Bank YouTube website, www.worldbank.org slash PI, or on the Diplomat website, www.the-diplomat.com. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.